every person acts acts as though they believe in freedom of the will. That includes the people who deny that they have freedom of the will. Mm -hmm. They act as if they believe it. That's why they present arguments to try to show that there's no free will. No point in preventing arguments if, if there isn't any. If we're just automata, what's the point of presenting arguments? It's just like two thermostats intercommunicating. So they all act 100% of the time as if they believe they have free will, give reasons, and so on. Well, that's point number one. Second question is, does science have anything to tell us about this? Answer, no, nothing. Uh, science can tell us we can deal with determinism, we can deal with randomness, but that's it. That was true in the 17th century. It's true today. So two points. Everyone acts 100% of the time as if they believe we have free will. You can't turn to science because it tells you nothing about it except that we can't handle it. So that leaves two possibilities. One is we're all 100% deluded. We're acting in contrary to the facts 100% of the time. Second possibility is there's something missing in human science. Okay, take your choice. Actually, if you don't, if you believe there isn't any choice, then you can't take it. Uh, but uh, the way everyone acts, they can act as if they have a choice between those alternatives. It doesn't matter much what the sophisticated theories tell us. This is essentially what we're left with. And in fact, it's if you look at the scientists who do study voluntary motion, there are good, good they don't talk about free will. They talk about trivial things like, can I decide to lift my finger or something? And their conclusion, I think maybe we've discussed this, I don't remember, but if you go to people like uh, Emilio Pizzi, uh, Robert Ajamian, the major scientists who deal with this, they have a state-of-the-art review in the Journal of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in which they go through what's ever been, what's been learned about controlling the minimal activities, eye blink, lifting your finger. Mm. And then they say, they say, as they put it, we'll put this fancifully. And what they say fancifully is we've been done, we've come to understand something about the puppet and the strings, but we have nothing to say about the puppeteer. Yeah. It's just a total mystery. Mm. That's where we're left. So when you talk about free will, let's say libertarianism, compatibilism, and maybe a hard incompatibilism, how do these approaches navigate morality? This is such an important topic, I think, as part of this niche. Should distinguish the questions of free will from the questions of moral responsibility. Those are different topics. I mean, they're related, but distinct. Uh, almost all the uh, philosophical tendencies that you just mentioned almost entirely are concerned with questions of moral responsibility. They're not concerned with the question of, can I decide to lift my finger? Mm -hmm. and that's the question of freedom of will. Uh, uh, there are... It, there are concerns about if there is no freedom of will, uh, how do we assign moral responsibility? Well, that's a question you can't ask, but uh, it's only a meaningful question for those who think there's no free will. Mm -hmm. And in my opinion, nobody has that opinion. Mm -hmm. They may say they have it, but they act as if they don't believe it. 
what I'm inter I don't really care what, I don't think it's interesting what people think they believe. Mm. I think what's interesting is what they do believe. Yeah. And what they do believe you can determine from their actions. Mm. Again, it's a very striking fact that 100% of our actions, including those of people who claim they don't have free will, 100% of their actions uh, reflect a belief, mm. an unacknowledged belief that they do have free will. So since that's 100% of human behavior, it's kind of an interesting question why people deny what they believe, but separate kind of question. Mm. And these questions of moral responsibility do arise if you acknowledge that you have freedom of choice, uh, but that's not the domain in which the uh, tendencies that you describe function. Okay. If we do believe that we have free will, then these questions can arise quite seriously. If we claim hypothetically that there's no free will, then you get into complicated philosophical questions, but I don't personally see much point in exploring them because they're based on a hypothetical assumption which doesn't apply. It's an amusing discussion in your free time if you have nothing else to devote yourself to. I don't find it very interesting. I mean, there is an interesting, if you like, metaphysical question. Uh, do we have free will? Uh, well, again, we're left with what I said before. We always act, everyone, as if we have free will. Science tells us nothing about it. Uh, then we can make a choice. Maybe uh, human science just has its limits, which I think there's every reason to believe. I think we are organisms. We're not angels. If we're organisms, we are like other organisms. Every single one has scope and limits. Mm. And that's true for all of our capacities as well. Uh, people question that only for our mental capacities. I don't see why those should be different from any other capacity. Mm. In the case of every other organism, their cognitive capacities has scope and limits. In the case of humans, metaphorically speaking, below the neck, you know, meaning we everyone agrees, yes, we have scope and limits. There are those who claim, in fact, it's a huge number, maybe most philosophers, that up here something escapes uh, the natural world. It's a kind of methodological dualism, mm. which I see no reason to accept. It seems to be much more pernicious than traditional metaphysical dualism, which was in fact normal science. Take a look at Descartes, it was simply normal science. He said he could try to argue that everything in the world has a mechanical explanation, including most things about human beings. But then he noticed correctly, in fact, that there are certain aspects of ordinary human life which don't have a mechanical interpretation. And for me, particularly interesting is that one of the main ones in the discourse is just what you and I are now doing, the ability to carry out a normal conversation with others, uh, creative, making up new expressions, new thoughts, maybe never occurred in the history of the world, and able to allow others to uh, comprehend the inner workings of our minds by means of verbal communication. So he argued that that's beyond the bounds of mechanical uh, uh, explanation, and therefore, like any good scientist, postulated a new principle in his metaphysics, a new substance, race cogitans. Well, it turned out he was wrong. Mm. Turns out there isn't a mechanical explanation for anything. 
So in particular, not for normal verbal interaction. Uh, well, that left us, that's Newton basically, showed there's no mechanical explanations for anything in the world. Uh, he regarded that as a complete absurdity, but, but he was stuck with it. Uh, then very quickly, within a couple of years, in fact, came John Locke, who said, yes, Mr. Newton has demonstrated to us that the, what we call the material world has properties we can't comprehend. We're just, it's just a fact. So maybe organized matter, whatever or matter turns out to be, has the property of generating thought. Yeah, that's, I think, the answer to the question. Don't think it's been improved on since. So that's what we're left with. We have scope and limits, like everything else in the organic world. And it may be that the explanation for the freedom of will that all of us act as if we believe we have, maybe it's just beyond human cognitive capacity. If so, it wouldn't be unique.